invite Kevin Zwala up, who's a um, friend and uh, youth minister, and he'll introduce himself and his background as well. Oxycontin. I've lost him. 
my friend Josh that I graduated with, and my other friend Matt, all toxic kind of overdoses. I have a testimonial here from a girl named Kelly from Pinckney. She said, Dear Mr. Peace, I just want to start off saying you helped me so much. I thank you for coming here once again to our school. I remember you came here last year, but I didn't really listen to all your words then, but after that, my life went downhill. And now everything you said really hit home. My oldest brother went to jail on drug charges, and six months later, he was let out. One of his using buddies wanted to go and get loaded, so my brother said, why not? I want to take my new Mustang out. So he drove down to Detroit so his friend could get his heroin. My brother was the one that even though he was an addict, he, he never drove high because he always had nice cars. He never wanted to ruin them. But anyways, he's going down there, not wanting to use, but as I know from the NA meetings, I go to it with my mom. You have to stay away from the wet places and wet friends because no matter what they still use, and that's what happened to my brother. In those six months when he was locked up, the heroin had got more chemicals and more pure, but he thought it stayed the same. So he got the same dosage as he used to get. And took his junk, drove back out here to Howell. A few hours later, my mom's best friend who adopted him found him dead in the bathroom. He was blue, so they called 911 and tried to resuscitate him. But it did not work, and she told me he was gone. My parents, once they told me, I was beyond devastated. I instantly fell to the ground, crying and screaming. My brother Sean was dead at age 23 on his mom's bathroom floor. A better story of hope was from a girl named Lauren at an alternative high school that just said, the worst day of my life. She said, you remember when you were given a talk at our high school, you said, you remember the worst day of your life. And I know it looked like I wasn't paying attention because I was playing with my friends, but I heard every word. All those people who raised their hands remember thinking I've never had such a bad day. I've gone through hard times, but never have I had the worst day of my life until May 20th, 2011 came when my best friend overdosed. She almost died. Stitching her out was the hardest thing I ever had to do, but it saved her life, and now she's in rehab. And thank God she's alive, and I know she'll be back, and somehow, with you talking shortly, just for that day, it made it not so hard to deal with. What I've been wanting to say is thank you, because your words gave me hope. Because maybe this story can be told to help someone else deal with what I had to go through on that painful day, so they won't be as scared, confused, and confused and lost as I was. Thank you, Laura. So, as a youth speaker and a youth minister, I get hundreds of DMs on Instagram and tweets and Facebook messages and text messages and phone calls and people, youth primarily, that are in pain. And the one thing that so many of them lack, that so many of us take for granted, is hope. And, you know, sometimes this pain is caused by bullying, sometimes it's caused by violence, and sometimes it's caused by abandonment issues. But one of the biggest reasons why it's caused is due to death and loss of a loved one. And in particular, loss of a loved one due to a drug overdose. I'm not even going to ask the question, how many of us have been to a funeral? Um, I think every hand would go up and I'm not going to ask how many of it has been at somebody that you think died at too young of an age. And I'm not going to ask the question how many, how many died at too young of an age due to a drug-induced incident. Because every hand will go up. And see, we have that in common, right? We are all affected. And this pain, this pain is what unites us as human beings, right? All of us feel that. Some of our most painful memories in our hearts now today, sitting here, are due to the loss of life from people around us. But see, even though we have billions of nerve endings in our bodies, and we're meant to feel pain as human beings, we still have a choice how we're going to respond to that pain, right? And unfortunately, the phrase, hurt people hurt people, brings all that true because a lot of times that hurt people who hurt people are ourselves, that we are the hurt people. But then we choose to hurt ourselves, right? And even worse, that the self-harm to our bodies is done in such a destructive way and habits that we can't reverse. And we look at these temporary fixes and you know simple solutions to release some of that pain, 
And unfortunately, the methods that a lot of us choose are fatal ones. And I think to myself, you know, that all these people around us that need our help, right? I mean, I, I just spoke to a middle school, and this kid, I had to laminate this, but he came up to me after my talk, and he gave me this piece of paper and said, I'm a mistake. And his first name is Dylan. Everything, everything is a choice. That's the beauty of life, and it's also the tragedy, because one choice can be our last. Right? Life is so precious and it's so fragile, but yet sometimes we don't see it. And all these issues that are facing us, the addiction and the substance abuse and the suicide, those are only byproducts and symptoms of deeper root issues at the core. Right? These are issues of pain, boredom, no purpose, feelings of isolation, loneliness, emptiness. But it's our job here as a community, as people of faith too, to show others around us that can't see that, that feel alone, to let them know that they're not. Every one of us has a letter M etched on our palms. Every one of us. This letter M stands for miracle. That's what I told Dylan when I looked at him. And I said, I don't see you as this. I see you as a miracle. And I was there to remind him. And he told me, Mr. Peace, if you weren't here today, I wouldn't have seen the light is Mark. He was going home that night to take some pills. Very small student, always getting bullied and teased, turned to prescription drugs to deal with his pain. And it's up to us guys to be that reminder. I was at a workshop in Toledo, Ohio, with just 25 men, 25 women, challenged a workshop, trying to challenge people to be the change. And we we're all strangers. And after three days of spilling our guts, getting vulnerable, just showing all that we have to each other, I was closer to these 50 strangers in my own family. And they asked a question the final day of the workshop, the two facilitators, they said, how many of you have ever thought about taking your life? How many of you have ever tried? And out of 50 people, they asked those people to stand. Out of 50 people, I'm the only one that didn't stand. After I just spent three days seeing all the gold, all the worth, all the miracle in these people around me, and when I ever come to places like this or any school or anywhere trying to pretend that I know what goes on behind closed doors and trying to pretend that I know what people that have gone through this have truly experienced. I don't come here trying to pretend that. I just come with an open heart hoping to just touch a small piece of yours. And why do we need the help? I just pulled this up the other day. Halloween. This was just released. Overdose to skyrocket as kids eat opiates like candy. It says the Yale School of Medicine just did a study involving painkillers like Oxycontin, per Percocet, Vicodin, and the increase among children was dramatic. Ages 1 to 4, the number from 1997 to 2012 has increased 205%. Teens 15 to 19, the increase was 176%. Overall, it showed a 165% increase in poisonings from opiate painkillers among those 19 and under. The biggest reason? Because parents, adults, are using more and more painkillers. And there's more access. And then this just came out. This, this, is, this is why I'm, I'm up here. November 3rd, 2016, New York Times. Just released from the Center of Disease Control. Just released that it is now more likely for middle school students ages 10 to 14 to die from suicide than from traffic accidents. It was 4.5 times as likely that they would die from a traffic accident in 1999. 15 years later, the numbers are from 2014, the latest figures. They have now surpassed traffic accidents as the leading cause of death among middle school students ages 10 to 14, suicide. That thing is real. That's why we have to care. That's why we should be here. That's why I wish the whole community you know, was here, but we have to start somewhere, right? And the other reason is because one person can save a life. One person can make a difference. God, there's a story, an awesome story, about a man that said all his pain and all, the, all his heart, his heart's just crushing and breaking and pain from all the anguish and all the distress in the world. He's like, God, why didn't you send anybody? And he says, I did. I sent you. 
And see, these bracelets that I put on for you, my tops, they become my armor. Because every one of these bracelets that was given me, I had thousands of these, I brought a couple with me. But every one of these was given to me by a student like Dylan that said, Mr. Peace, if you weren't here today, I wouldn't be here tomorrow. So these are a reminder of the work that I'm doing and that we're doing. That these become my strength whenever I speak. Because we're going to all face storms. But storms even have to happen for rainbows to appear, for new life to spring up, right? This was given to me by a student. This is his hospital bracelet. And after one of his talks, he came up to me in tears and he hugged me. And he said, I don't want to carry this anymore. And he took it out of his wallet and let me take it from him. So tears of strength, they're the sweat of our strength, and they start to heal. And if we can be that person that just reflects in these other people to let them know that they are those miracles, that they are worth something, then we're doing our job. I get testimonials, like my friend Brad, he said, Mr. Peace, I just wanted to let you know that I was in the crowd when you spoke today at school. You really inspired me to believe I'm worth something. You changed my life, and I can't thank you enough. You saved me. A girl from Grand Lane said, Mr. Peace, my whole life I know nothing but fighting, arguing, screaming, yelling, all over drugs. I personally have never done any, but my brother has. Lots of times, I was born a crack baby. I remember being four years old in my house being shot at by drug dealers. And everyone, including me, sometimes thinks I'm never going to amount to anything. My brother has a great way to on that side of my family. He has my brother dropped out. I plan on being the first in my family on both sides to get a high school diploma. Here I am, I'm not the only one who has to deal with a rough life, made me feel so much better about myself. Today I was planning on going home, doing my homework, maybe eating a snack, sending an email to all of my friends and family, telling them that I love them, and then ending my life. I even had it all planned out, but you saved me. And I'd be ungrateful if you hadn't come to my school today. I wouldn't be writing this email. Thank you. And I've told these stories over and over again. I can't tell you every time I speak, at least one or two students comes up to me, whether I'm in Kentucky or California or Michigan or out east, and they say, Mr. Peace, I'm going to tear my letter up tonight. I'm going to get rid of the pills tonight. I'm going to burn the whole notebook that I have tonight. These wooden hands were given to me as a reminder from one of my students that said I was like their helping hands during life's greatest need, that they were ready to check out. And just being a part of their life is what kept them going. So every day I see these helping hands, I think to myself, I can just be one person's helping hands and doing my job. Because the reality is that we break a pot and glue it back together. It's broken, and all of us are broken somehow, right? I'm, I was broken until... Christ broken, that's what I tell people, and I feel that light, though, can still shine through brokenness. And if that's true, then we need to bring that light to people that are needing that beyond, I mean, needing it more than life because it comes down to whether or not they're going to live, right? And we need to be that love in action and bring that light to them. And make sure, like, like we're talking about today, that these people didn't die in vain. That the best way to honor their legacy is by how we choose to live today. That's the best way we can do that. And the question, you know, how will they be remembered? How many lives will we save? The answer to those questions is how we choose to answer how do we want to be remembered? What are we going to do to bring change? Because before you blink, you're all alone up and life has passed you by. Because you're more fully present and then you wonder why. People are dying with the music still left inside and wishing they found their purpose at age 25. Or 32 in their 80s really any time. Just so long as they find it before their last rites. I bet if I'm telling you peace, I need something besides the drugs. They want to get involved in serving others out of love. Then I'm going to bring you to ask you for more volunteer. Opportunity so they can bring some more cheer. They want to give away they have and specialty to kids living on the streets or in an orphanage. So do something major, minor, heck, do something drastic. Just do something, but please don't wreak no more havoc. And while you're at it, now that you are spiritually awoken, make sure to change those around you through every word that's spoken. Word. Thanks for 
touch my heart. Thanks for being here.